I'd like to welcome all of you to Lunch Learn Link seminar today. Uh, we're really privileged to have Graham Warren come and talk with us about smoking cessation, especially in the clinical context. So his title is Smoking and the Cancer Patient, Behavioral, Clinical, Biologic, and Administrative Considerations. Some of you may know that the Maryland Cancer Plan has urged all Maryland hospitals to have a smoking cessation plan, strategy, implementation in their facilities. And um, at the Sidney Kimmel Comprehensive Cancer Center, we're working toward this as well as a cancer center. So um, this is an important um, area for us to move into in terms of uh, cancer research and, and programs. Um, so I welcome the University of Maryland uh, folks, the Howard University and the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. For the audience in the room, uh, as some of you know, there are tickets for lunch, so Nicole will be coming down one aisle or the other, and you can get a ticket for pizza afterward. And uh, we welcome you to stay and talk with, with Graham. So Graham uh, Warren is a, uh, a physician and a PhD researcher. He is a member of the Department of Radiology. In fact, he's vice chair for research uh, in his department of radi radiation oncology at the Hollins Cancer Center. And um, I've gotten a preview of his talk, so I hope uh, you find uh, some tidbit that you can take back uh, in terms of uh, launching some smoking cessation in a clinical care setting. So he, he'll, he will focus on cancer patients today. So uh, join me in welcoming uh, Graham Warren. So thank you for having me today. I certainly appreciate the opportunity to come and speak to you today uh, a little bit about a topic. And this will actually be something that spans uh, hopefully a, a reasonable breadth of considering how tobacco is something to consider in, in cancer patients. Uh, as we get started, uh, I do want to make sure that I disclose I'm not going to be selling anything. Uh, I'm not going to make any money off anything that I tell you. There's not going to be any off-label use or otherwise. I do have some editorial roles and some uh, national participation in different committees. Uh, I, I don't represent uh, those committees or the national organizations, but I anticipate a lot of the things that I say are going to be in harmony with the things that, that you'll hear from these national organizations as well. So I don't think I'm going to say anything particularly funny. I'm not going to make any money off it either. So hopefully it'll be a good discussion today. Um, when we started thinking about cigarette smoke, uh, we, we know that cigarette smoke is uh, the largest preventable risk factor for the development of cancer. This has been well established. Uh, this is something that uh, has been analyzed over and over again through Surgeon General's reports and other uh, consensus statements. Uh, but what's not really necessarily known is that in addition to the number of chemicals that are, that are in cigarette smoke, there's a lot of additives. And these additives are used to try and increase flavor, absorption, and addiction. And I got this off a website about 10 years ago. Uh, there's a lot of things that are added to cigarettes, and this is kind of an alphabetical list. A lot of strange things that are added. See, things like acetic acid, ammonia, apple juice concentrate. And if you wanted to try and take a look at the whole list of 600 additives that's added to tobacco, uh, this is a list. I always get a kick out of this because when you start thinking about lighting this stuff on fire and inhaling it, it's not rocket surgery to figure out that it's probably going to be bad for you. And so, uh, you know, tobacco is one of these things that, that we've done a great job leading up to development of cancer. One of the issues is, and, and actually here, you all are experts in this area. Um, I mean, I think that the, the School of Public Health, Bloomberg School of Public Health, is one of the world leaders. So I'm probably talking far beneath your all understanding. But in reality, when you start thinking about tobacco use, it's always important to remember that there are regional and geographic differences and a lot of cultural influences that could could affect tobacco use consumptions. This actually replaced an old slide that I had, but this is from the BRFS survey from 2012, taking a look at current smokers every day and some days between males and females. And you can see you know, pretty significant differences based just on gender and geographic diversity. 
I'm, uh, I'm, I'm at the Medical University of South Carolina, but I actually spent most of my life growing up here in Kentucky, this brown state down here in the southeast. Now this is from a little while back, and I will joke, please recognize that this is a joke, this is actually lung cancer death rates. You can see the ge geographic distribution. Uh, I always joke that this white county in Kentucky is not because nobody smoked there, it's because maybe nobody went there to ask a question. Um, it's, it's not necessarily inaccurate to say that that the best quality that we have also depends on the ability to get the data accurately from different uh, distributions. But it really is a big geographic influence with regards to smoking rates leading to lung cancer. I don't think I'll ever get rid of this slide altogether. I just like the way that it's really organized. And you might ask yourself, why is this so? Well, if your mother smokes, your father smokes, your brother and sister smoke, you're going to smoke. Uh, just for disclosure, this is one of my kids. I've got five kids. This is one of them. Uh, we actually stenciled in this stogie several years ago. You can see that the, the art is probably good, but could be better. The mom tattoo, though, has been there, and he loves his little dinosaur tie. The point of the matter being is that these habits start very early. And right now, my personal bests are, uh, I used to be that I had a, uh, the, the patients that started smoking when they were seven years old. I had a few patients the past several years that told me they started took a puff or two when they were four. The ones that were seven, what happened was their mother or father, but usually mother was taking them to school and gave them a cigarette to get it warmed up on the way to school. The most I've encountered so far in clinic is a 267 pack year history. 267 pack years. It's living in a cloud for 55 years. I mean, it's an incredible potential to you know, use this product for such a long time and starting in youth can lead to an imprinting pattern that's extremely hard to break. So I'm really excited about what we did in 2014 because uh, this was really the first Surgeon General's report that not only looked at the effects of tobacco on cancer risk and things, but really provided a very good analysis of the effects of tobacco on cancer treatment outcomes. Specifically, it looked at about 400 different studies reporting on over 500,000 patients looking at the effects of smoking on overall mortality, cancer-related mortality, risk of second primary, and so forth. Um, I was a contributor to this section. Uh, I will say that if you're ever asked by the Surgeon General's report to do some work, you will work for about 18 cents an hour. Uh, it will not be something that you'll make money on. But I will tell you this, the nice thing that came out of it was that we looked at an extensive amount of literature. It's about 1,800 man hours of work to put this together. And this went through 15 different levels of review. By the way, I, I might be wrong on actually how many levels of review, but a lot of levels of review. And the conclusions we didn't have until it came out the day of, of the release. And you can see that through all the reviews, in cancer patients and survivors, uh, smoking by cancer patients and survivors caused adverse outcomes. It increased overall mortality, this is across disease sites and treatments. It increased cancer-specific mortality, which means you die of cancer increased risk for second primary cancer, and there was a very strong association with cancer-related toxicity, cancer treatment-related toxicity. And when you think about cancer treatment toxicity, I don't know how many people in the room are physicians. How many people are physicians, just out of curiosity? So cancer docs, primary care, any cancer docs? So when you think about it from a public health standpoint, I want you to remember that when you try and standardize something across cancer treatment as a whole, you remember you got head and neck, lung, breast, prostate, colon, rectal, anal, anal pancreatic, uh, CNS disease. You got cancer across all these disease sites. You have surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, biologic therapy, combinations. You have neutropenia, all these different side effects. So what I'm getting at is that it's such a heterogeneous, heterogeneous population and outcome set that it's hard to really draw causation. But when you look at the magnitude with regards to overall mortality, it's about a 51% increased risk of overall mortality in people who are current smokers. Cancer-related mortality, 61% increased risk. This is across all studies, positive and negative, median risks. If you try to take a look at it according to the disease site, these here in red bars are studies that show one or more significant negative associations between tobacco use and outcome. This isn't a head and neck or a lung cancer problem. This is a cancer problem. Here just gives you an idea across hematologic, breast, guy, and so forth. You can see the magnitude of studies that actually show one or more negative outcomes. There's good and bad about this. The bad about this is it affects a lot of cancer. The good thing about this is that this can also be somewhat of a unifying topic. You don't have to look at cancer patients that have head and neck cancer with smoking differently necessarily than breast versus prostate versus chemo or surgery. 
This is something that you can look at kind of from cancer treatment on a larger scale. So you can really kind of address this in a systematic manner and maybe benefit cancer patients as a whole. I always use prostate cancer as an example, breast and prostate cancer. Uh, maybe I'll go back one. Does anyone want to tell me what most prostate cancer patients die from? Not too many. Anyone? Not prostate cancer. This is actually a nice little estimate. Uh, this was from 2008 study by Bittner. It actually took a look at causes of death in prostate cancer patients. Less than 10% died of prostate cancer themselves. Most of them died from something different. And look at the hazard ratios associated with current smoking. We put a ton of effort into surgery, radiation, uh, androgen deprivation therapy, treatment of prostate cancer, but for dominant causes of death, smoking is certainly something that's very important that we need to consider in prostate cancer. Breast cancer, the same thing. Uh, breast cancer, about 85% of patients will survive breast cancer. Um, now, it depends on stage and so forth, but what I'm getting at is that even with disease sites that have very high cure rates, smoking is extremely important because it still affects cardiovascular disease, stroke, all these other types of things in addition to cancer treatment. So you might ask yourself, well, what about cessation in cancer patients? This isn't out yet, but I want to make sure everyone gets a chance to see this. We've gone through and really reviewed all, tried to find all the studies that really focus on cessation in cancer patients. And granted, this is not, hasn't been reviewed externally yet. There might be one or two small errors here, but this is really gives you some of the information that looks at least with regards to smoking cessation after diagnosis and mortality. Now earlier, I showed you all about a 61% increase, 50 to 60% increased risk of mortality in cancer patients who are current smokers, right? Now you all are theoretically at least as probably engaged with public health as I am, so you're probably better at this than I am. Take a look at these ratios here. This is quit versus persistent smoking, persistent versus quit. I told you there's about a 50% increased risk of mortality. Here I'm showing you pretty close to an inversion of that risk if you quit smoking. I'm a radiation oncologist. I'm going to treat about 5,000 cancer patients in my entire life. I'm going to benefit maybe 2,000 or possibly 3,000 patients with pain or life, you know, length of their life or disease control or something. But usually I have to have something called a number needed treat of about 5 to 10 to make it worthwhile. Number needed to treat means how many patients do I treat to benefit one? We change breast cancer management from one chemotherapy to another based on 4% improvements, which means I got to treat 25 patients to benefit one over the standard treatment. That's a lot. If I have a 50% increased risk of mortality, and here I show you that I'm fairly well inverting it, does anyone want to tell me what direction that points us? What's my number needed to treat? This suggests the number needed to treat may be one or two. One or two. That means if you have a couple of patients who smoke at the time of diagnosis and you don't get them to quit, you need to ask yourself, have I increased their chance of overall mortality? That's profound. Now granted, we got a lot of studies that show the effects of smoking in cancer patients, not as many showing cessation, but the signal right now is significant. Unfortunately right now, we looked at this several years ago, uh, looking at tobacco use in clinical, cooperative group clinical trials. About 71% did not assess tobacco use whatsoever in clinical trial design. Uh, that means our primary outcomes, overall survival, recurrence, toxicity, primary and secondary outcomes of all clinical trials designed, 71% of those trials are not assessing tobacco use, even though tobacco can affect that. However, we went back and said, well, what if we ask oncologists about what they do? And we sent out several surveys. One was with ISLC, one was with ASCO, and then this is unpublished right now. We've had a couple abstracts about this. Long and short of it is that about 90% of oncologists asked about tobacco use, which is really good. About 80% advised patients to quit. Only about 30 or 40% tried to help people quit smoking. And if you go in the literature and you start digging into patient reported patterns, you actually see that this, 20, this drops down to around 20% that actually receive cessation support in cancer care. So then we went back and said, we asked all these different questions. Now, I, I granted, I, I've done a million of these talks, I realize this text is too small. There's one point, a bunch, among a whole bunch of different possible reasons why you don't provide cessation support or why you don't ask or otherwise. The major predictive barriers to providing cessation support, discussing medications or helping patients quit, really came down to three things. Education, you know, they had enough education to provide cessation support, time and resources. 
education, time, resources. 90% of these people actually said that smoking was bad for cancer treatment and it should be a standard part of cancer care. So I'm not gonna persuade them by saying tobacco's bad necessarily, but it had to do with education, time, resources. So that follow-up survey we haven't published yet, we asked about education. We said, who do you wanna provide cessation support? And I know I presented this, I don't know, 20 times, maybe 30 times, and I always kind of get a kick out of this. I just want to point out that this little red sliver right here, 1% said they wanted to treat patients themselves. 50% of respondents said, I really don't care who does it, just not me. I want someone else to take care of this, right? So the motivation to provide cessation support for my colleagues may not be that great. We went back and said, well, what if we tried to help educate you? And they said about 10% said that they had adequate training. 55% said train someone else in my clinic. So education can be good, but I'm not sure that that's gonna provide a solution with regards to providing cessation support if we rely on oncologists to provide cessation support through an educational program. Now there's a reason for education. I'm gonna get back to this in a little bit, but I'm not sure we can rely on them to do it all together. This was corroborated even further, uh, sorry, uh, it was corroborated even further when we asked if we developed a dedicated cessation program, which was embedded in a different part of the questionnaire. This was another chance for them to say, no, I want to take care of myself. I said, we're going to give this to a cessation program. Who do you want this to be? Again, only 1% said they wanted to treat patients themselves. About 58% wanted people within their institution, but an awful lot didn't really care if they were institution or outside of the institution. So providing cessation resources, people are receptive to it. Oncologists don't really want to do it themselves. We need to keep that in mind. I call this customer disservice. We're not satisfied until you're not satisfied. I have a lot of people I've met who are staring out the window trying to figure out exactly what it is they're gonna do next. We know that tobacco's bad. We're not doing necessarily a very good job. This is something that I think we need to do quite a bit better with. So we started working on this when we were actually at Roswell Park. And we said, how are we gonna solve this problem in a digestible manner? I'm a radiation oncologist which means I care a lot about tobacco. I have a wet lab. We actually look in cancer cells at mechanisms of therapeutic resistance using smoke and other types of things. We've looked at starting cessation programs. We've built a few of them. We've helped other programs build it. The long and short of it is I'm still a radiation oncologist. My administrators and administrators, almost all the centers I go, are not gonna support me, one of the most expensive docs that there are, spending a lot of time providing cessation support when I can't bill for it very much. They don't want me slowing down the clinic. They don't want me taking up time with regards to you know, patient satisfaction, all these drivers and quality metrics that centers are using all together. I need to make sure I consider that. So we built this thing at Roswell Park to try and develop a screen, a clinically efficient mechanism for providing cessation support. What we did is we said, we want to screen patients with a structured assessment. If they're screen positive for tobacco use, they're automatically referred to a cessation service, automatically, electronically. I'm not looking for the physician to refer. I'm not looking for the patients to call. They're automatically referred electronically. And then we try and contact them, see if they want to participate. If they accept, they go into the cessation program. And if they don't, we kind of get a loop back here. Okay? We got a lot of lessons we learned from this. This was one of the biggest lessons. We looked at the first 12,000 people screened. 2,700 people referred to the cessation program. We had half that we called, tried to call with five cessation attempts. We were able to reach 81% of patients by proactively reaching out to try and see if they want to participate. 3% refused cessation support. That means more than 90% were receptive. It doesn't mean 90% quit. It means I got their attention. 90% were receptive. Let's look up here. The other half got mailings. 1,381 mailings. 16 out of 1,381 who got mailings called our program. I killed a whole forest and I got no one to call the program. In this case, this really challenges the utility of relying on mailings to try and contact cessation, or pay patients for cessation. But this proactive outreach seemed to be very useful, clinically efficient, didn't slow my clinic down. I could put that anywhere. So the next question would be, well, if we got so many people in, was this clinically efficient? So we looked at this. When we built this thing at, at Roswell, we literally had 25 people in the room that I called together to say, we need to address tobacco use. We had nurses, tobacco specialists, IT specialists, administrators, clinicians. How do we want to build this thing? 
We literally had 37 questions that we thought were important on the first one. I didn't think we'd get 37 questions through. I said, guys, it's never gonna work. I said, no, we need to try and do this. So, okay, we'll try it. Within two weeks, we were just about shut down by nursing because 37 questions in clinic is not gonna work. What we did find out was that of all the questions we could ask about tobacco use to identify people who needed cessation support, this isn't like ever tobacco use in pack years. I need to find out who's using tobacco and if they're using them, need to get them to cessation, right? Three questions identified almost 99% of patients. And, and there's a little variant on this, but how long has it been since you smoked tobacco? Or excuse me, um, how long has you um, smoked a cigarette, even a single puff? This really increased it. We captured all of these and this one. If you had one question to put in, that type of a question is extremely high yield. Anyone in the past 30 days, you can refer to a cessation program. But now, rather than having 37 questions, if I want to get people in a cessation program, I can do it with very few questions. The second thing, which I really wish somebody else would duplicate, we went back and said, how often do we have to ask about tobacco use? We always talk about tobacco use assessments as a vital sign. Go put that in oncology care, who, for people who have to come in once a week for chemotherapy or once every day for chemotherapy. Make that your institutional standard, see how long that one lasts. It didn't last very long for us. What we did was we went back and looked at the 400, 428 people who were referred to our cessation program. And we said, if we ask no more than once a month, how many people do we miss? How many people do we delay access to cessation support if we ask no more frequently than once a month? Look at this, less than 1% of people who need cessation support have a delayed referral if we go from instead of every single time to doing it no more than once a month. That's clinical efficiency. And I wish this would be published more because right now this is the only reference we've got for this in cancer care. So we got a cessation program, great. People want to participate, wonderful. We can make it efficient, sounds awesome. What does it make any difference with regards to outcome? So what we did is we went back and looked at our thoracic patients. And we looked at the effects of cessation adjusted for all these different clinical variables. And the long and short of it, it, people who came into the cessation program and quit smoking, we reduced mortality by 44% in addition to whatever their first line lung cancer treatment was. 44%. I don't have anything else right now I can add to first line lung cancer treatment to reduce mortality by 44%. And this isn't the final answer. I mean, this is in a couple hundred patients. But this is a huge signal for potentially improving our outcomes. And I showed you earlier, with regards to cessation, other studies that showed that you had significant reductions in mortality if you get them to quit. Phone-based cessation program, automated, report, automated uh, referral service, improved mortality. We also looked at this National Lung Cancer Screening Trial. Actually, uh, Nicole Tanner, who's an excellent uh, physician down at Medical University of South Carolina, worked with um, Gerard Silvestri on this. And we found that in the NLST, we had a 20% mortality reduction in patients who quit smoking for seven years. So at seven years, we got people to quit smoking for seven years. We just broke even with the benefit of low-dose CT screening more than seven years. We kind of capped out at about a 38% reduction with 15 years of cessation. So incorporating cessation into standard clinical practice for CT screening is a great idea. Again, it's not rocket surgery. This is all about thinking about how are we going to get effective medicine into practice. It's amazing how much easier it is for a team to work together when nobody has any idea where they're going. It's another one of these things I see a lot these days, right? So smoking is bad. We might be able to do something about it. How can we start considering this a little bit further? Well, we've written about this. This actually came out of DaVita. Uh, we're updating this chapter now, but it's going to be very similar. DaVita is the, kind of the, the Bible for oncology care, but it just gives oncologists an opportunity to read about how to try and think about implementing cessation into practice. goes through a few questions, and then the Ask Advisor refer the five A's models, uh, and then Ask Advisor refers a little bit later. You can ask about tobacco use with structured questions. These are here so you can refer to later. There's actually some updates to these types of things, but there's some questions you can look at. This is the flow pattern. Basically, you want to try and make sure that you give access to cessation support for patients throughout their cancer treatment paradigm. I'm a, clinic, I'm a proponent of clinical efficiency, so you got to do this in a way that's sustainable in the clinic. If you're going to look about the whole process, try and identify who's going to ask, how you're going to refer, where they're going to refer, and getting clinician buy-in is a big deal. I'm very happy. You'll see this is a little outdated, 2015, but I'm very happy because this is the first edition I can't tell you how excited I am, is that now the NCCN guidelines across cancer disease sites and treatment 
smoking cessation. Anyone who uses tobacco use in the past 30 days, smoking cessation. It's been updated and updated. It says about the same thing, NCC and guidelines. Now I've got the Surgeon General's report for it's bad. I got NCC and guidelines, you gotta provide cessation support. So whenever you have an oncologist that says, I don't feel like providing cessation support, just say, well, is that against NCC and guidelines? And probably it is. So now you have an impetus that you can use to try and help change. This was the questions I was talking about. NCI and ACR led by Stephanie Land really started addressing you know, the issues of tobacco use in cancer clinical trials and the fact that we didn't define tobacco use very well. There was a task force that worked on this and a couple different papers came out cognitively testing different questions that you can ask. And there's a whole lot of details behind this. These are really nice to be able to see how the recommendations came out to ask for tobacco in, in, in cancer patients. But let's go back to practice. Let's say you're stuck. You got one question, one question you put in clinical care. What is that question going to be? How long has it been since you last smoked a cigarette, even one puff? And you have an annotated response system. Smoked a cigarette today. Less than one, or one to seven days, less than a month. Anyone in this box, referral to a cessation program. You can make it more than that, okay? I fully support making it more than that. That's fine. But if you're talking about clinical efficiency to identify people who need cessation support, that is the number one question. You can color code this for paper. You can put it on a fax referral. You can put it in an EMR. You can annotate it for automated design. Beautiful. As dumb as it sounds, as it might sound, I'm really happy that now we've got a good question we can ask to identify people who need cessation support in cancer care. I will say this, you all are Hopkins. I hate to say it, but you're gonna kind of carry the bellwether with regards to public health. So a lot of eyes are on you all. It's hard to be knocked off the top if you're not careful. So accuracy could be important, right? A lot of us have looked at accuracy of self-assessments and self-reported tobacco use in cancer patients. About 30% of patients will misrepresent tobacco use. This was an accident study. We had a study of head and neck cancer patients. So we're gonna treat you with radiation and chemotherapy. We're gonna ask you about tobacco use every week during treatment, and we're gonna measure it in your blood. Do you wanna participate or not? We're gonna pay you anything. You wanna participate or not? And they said, yes. So we went back and looked. <laughs> We've got this group of people here that will misrepresent tobacco use week after week after week after week. So what I'm getting at is that if you really want to have a good structured assessment, you want to do research or other types of things, biochemical validation can be a big assist. I'm happy to talk about it further. Just realize that self-report has some limits. You got to think about clinical efficiency, but also if you're going to use it for research purposes and outcomes, make sure you consider things like biochemical confirmation. Incompetence, when you earnestly believe you can compensate for a lack of skill by doubling your efforts, there's no amount, no end to what you can't do. I got five kids. I don't know how many pieces of wood I've got that look like that, but I got a lot of them. In this case, if we want to try and make cessation more effective, one thing that we know makes a big difference leading up to cancer is the biology. We haven't done a very good job afterwards. And we know this because a few years ago, we actually reviewed studies that took a look at the effects of smoking in cancer cells, cigarette smoke on cancer cells, 2014. There are, I don't know how many thousand studies on smoking leading to cancer in all kinds of cells. We found 34 studies looking at the effects of cigarette smoke in cancer cells, 34 studies, 2014, 34 studies. So here we've got some pathways that are certainly not complete. What we did is we went back and said, well, let's start developing some models here. We've been working on this a lot. And I'm not gonna go into a ton of biology. I gotta focus here, okay? Long and short of it is we developed a chronic cigarette smoke exposure model to try to figure out if we could mimic what we saw in the clinic. Can we develop a model that cigarette smoke decreases the effectiveness of radiation or chemotherapy? And, and those types of things are in here. If you want to, I'm happy to talk about the biology. But the point of this slide is one thing. When we start talking about the effects of cigarette smoke on cancer cells, Focus right here, dang it. Focus right here. I got bigger fingers than this clicker. Focus right here. These are plates from a colony survival assay. Has anyone heard of a colony survival assay? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So long and short of it is that you got cells that grow on a plate. You let them grow for a while, you wash it off, then you stain them purple. Purple cells are cells that are living. Purple colonies are cells that live through whatever it is that you did. These are colon cancer cells we treat with radiation alone. Not that many cells there. I mean, almost none, right? 
This is the same thing with cigarette smoke. Does anyone not understand this? Are you leaving this much behind if you let people continue to smoke during cancer treatment? These are the types of questions we haven't answered well. Why haven't we got the handle on this biologically? It's 2017. Why haven't we figured this out yet? And if it is resistant to cancer treatment, can we use that to make cancer treatments much more effective? Well, we started messing with that. This is actually nicotine, but our, the whole purpose behind this was that we started taking a look at the nicotinic receptor and stick, stimulation of the nicotinic receptor. Again, we don't have to focus on a lot of the biology today, but what I do want to emphasize is specifically what we did during radiation right here or chemoradiation exposure during this time significantly changed tumor growth. And then how many people here are pathologists? I guess I shouldn't comment one way or the other. We've got people I'm not here, right? I didn't choose pathology, which I'm happy with. However, I want to see if you can tell. These are lung cancer tumors, xenografts we call them. And what we do is we treated them with nicotine for a while. I'm not trying to say don't use nicotine. This is just along one receptor. But I want you to look at this. We treated nicotine for about a week and then we took it away for a couple days. And this is what it looked like. You're looking for black cells, brown cells, nuclei is what you're looking for. This is if you didn't take it away. Can anyone see a difference between the two? Can anyone not see a difference between the two? This was two or three days of removal. At the time, there were a few studies that were looking at HIF-1-alpha for clinical trials designs a few years ago. It had nothing to do with smoking, nothing to do with activation nicotinic receptor, but smoking by itself. If we can change some biologic parameters within a few days by just changing exposure to nicotinic receptor agonists, for instance, wouldn't it be important to try and change the dynamic features of cigarette smoke in the context of cytotoxic cancer treatment? I know it sounds dumb that we're talking about this now, but these are the types of things we need to do a lot better job of. Then we went back. Now, this is unfortunate. I have to give a disclaimer. So some of this is going through some proprietary stuff, but I want you to see something. So there's going to be protein X and SNP Y and 1 and 2. We thought everything kind of behaved the same way with cigarette smoke, but I think we're wrong. We found a germline polymorphism. We're going to call it SNP1 and SNP2. That when you exposed cells to cigarette smoke, you had a significant increase in a protein. And you can measure this in patient samples here. The reason this is important is because when I treat, this is a control cell, so this is survival fraction. When it goes up, cells are resistant. When I treat in two different cell lines, two different SNPs, here I get resistance, here I get resistance, here I get resistance. However, with the SNPs the opposite, I give a targeted therapy, look what happens. Boom, back to normal, boom, back to normal, boom, back to normal. Is it possible that we might have a germline polymorphism? This is one, probably more than this, that could lead to activation of a targeted pathway that we can inhibit. And now we have people who smoke at the time of diagnosis and maybe we can do a targeted therapeutic to help their, their outcomes get better. If that's possible, have you ever heard anyone talk about that before? So far, I haven't had anyone in a crowd, other than someone who'd already heard my talk before already, bring it up. And if we haven't brought it up, why haven't we brought it up? These are the types of questions we need to ask. Whew. Anyone heard of PDL1? Actually, has anyone's kids not heard of PDL1? PDL1 is immunotherapy, right? Immunotherapy, everything. Immunotherapy somehow is probably in this bottle of water, right? Immunotherapy. I, I don't have a reason for this. This was because we had a meeting last year and somebody was arguing that with immunotherapy, we should encourage people to keep smoking. And I said, I don't think that sounds like a good idea. So we just played around in a lab ourselves. But we changed this protein we think is important, which is not related to this at all. At least nobody's ever tied these proteins together. What we did is we took this and turned these SNPs around. Take a look at what happens with baseline PDO one expression. And we used EGF as kind of a broad mitogenic stimulus. Our stimulus patterns didn't change. Look at this PDO one difference. So if this pathway that leads to some targeted therapeutics and benefits with smoking and these types of things, what if it does have differences like this with regards to pdl one expression? Seems like we could ask this well enough in the context of cigarette smoking. It's not that hard. Do your pdl one do your immunotherapy, do your targeted therapeutic, but ask about tobacco use. You know what, just give me a little bit of urine or blood or saliva or something. Something I can measure it. So this changes in where you have a current smoker, hypothetically. 
you get immediate structure cessation support, and then you might be able to make decisions based on biomarkers. And in this case, we don't have to go into any more biology right now, but I just want to leave it out there for something to think about that maybe you haven't encountered before. I refinanced our house a few years ago and I got put on one of these lists. I'm doctor, I can't pronounce it with the union of who cares where, and I want to give you $39 million. Give me your bank account, right? Sounds like a good idea, but maybe it doesn't work out exactly the way you plan unless you, I guess it could work out, but most of the time it doesn't work out the way you plan. We got this information, how do we try and do something about it? I'm proposing to try and help clear up the thought process. This is not reference, this is just an idea, and it may not be a good idea. If I do this enough and people say it's a great idea, I'll do something about it. If I say it's a bad idea, I won't. Well, we got stage one through four cancer. Well, I propose perhaps staging tobacco use in cancer patients. Stage one is clear evidence that smoking has an adverse effect, done, boom, Surgeon General's report, finished. We can keep publishing on this, but it's there. We know it's bad. Evidence to know whether or not cessation could benefit. We actually have some there. We could probably do more. We really could do more, but we actually have some pretty good evidence there. We are at stage three. How do we implement change? And change is kind of a broad thing. How do we make clinical processes better? Find out who benefits from cessation one way versus the other. I'm a huge proponent in what we call an opt-out setting, in which case all patients are automatically identified, referred to a cessation program. This is where we are, we're just mired in this thing right now. This is where we are at. But then there's the other thing. Identifying existing or new cancer treatments that are the best cancer treatments for people who smoke at the time of diagnosis. I'll say that again. Identifying the existing or unidentified cancer treatments who are best to treat cancer patients who smoke at the time of diagnosis. Rather than just talking about cessation and we're going to get people to quit and we're going to ask how they feel and these type of things, get them to quit. But maybe we have an optimal strategy. This is as yet completely untapped in an area we really need. And I, I'm not just trying to say, if people quit smoking, go back to the original slides. What if we had something that decreased the effectiveness of cancer treatment across disease sites and treatments? You could call it whatever you wanted to. In this case, it's smoking. But don't you want to understand that mechanism? If you could understand that mechanism, could you make your cancer treatments, maybe in people who don't smoke, a lot better? I anticipate you probably can, right? Right here. This is what can be done, especially at centers like this. We went and had a nice meeting. I'm going to run through these. They have a lot of words on them, but you're going to have reference to these type of things. But I want you to be thinking about this from a public health perspective. You're going to face this. You're going to face this at cancer centers. You're probably going to face it here. You're going to face it in the community. When you start thinking about a cancer center, what do you think about? I talk to a lot of administrators to come up with this. So it's not a published thing. But this is just opinions of a lot of different administrators. A place that has high quality research. It, interestingly enough, public doesn't really you know, know a whole lot about it, but they want a stamp of approval. They like that stamp, right? If you lose that stamp, that's a bad thing. Designation technically is all about research. Designation, NCI designation, is not technically about clinical care. It's about research. This whole idea of smart people rubbing off on clinical staff making cancer better, whether it actually happens or not, a lot of times that's the perception in the community, right? It increases your scope and outreach. Uh, losing NCI designation is disastrous. We know some places that's happened and it can make a big difference. Um, but interestingly enough, patterns of care will fall back into place even if that happens. And this is one that um, should be what happens. Coherence and validity. Evidence-based medicine, evidence-based approaches, coherence, coherence. I don't want to ask anybody about coherence right now because it's hard to find coherence in too much of anything. But from an administrative standpoint, coherence and validity is important. Bundle payments are coming. Practical administrative condition, uh, considerations. Bundle payments are coming. I think you might already have them right here. Uh, but bundle payments are coming. Trying to figure out how to fit care into a specific cost is a big deal. Quality of care. Engagement is a huge issue, so getting good physician engagement, having top-down and bottom-up communications is very important. A good committed staff and the ability to pay a good wage. This is a huge challenge at most places right here, but this is the overriding theme. How can we do this in a really strong cost containment environment? I'm bringing up all these things because these are types of issues. I haven't mentioned smoking here, right? These are practical administrative issues you're going to have to think about in the development of a program. Regarding tobacco, Cancer centers and administrators. 
money. If I could make it bigger and still put stuff on a slide, I would. It'd be under highlighted, it'd be glowing in the dark, little pretty things growing out of it. Money. It comes down to money. Whereas I'm going to propose that smoking is probably the most cost-effective method for us to improve cancer care right now. Right now, today, I think smoking cessation is the most cost-effective cancer treatment we can do right now. We do all our other stuff, add smoking cessation. It's cheap to do, and it can make a huge difference because cancer costs just so much money. If we can do this, we're going to have to address tobacco. And, and, and this is where I need you all to think differently and talk to your colleagues a little bit differently. Right now, this is Bloomberg. I mean, this is like, this is it. There's not much too much above this at all, if there is. But if you're focused on prevention, you're not doing enough. You need to be thinking about prevention and treatment. And I mean cancer treatment, not just smoking to try and prevent stuff from happening or they need to do behavioral stuff. No, smoking cessation is a part of cancer treatment. Part of cancer treatment. Does that make sense? NCI, by the way, right now technically doesn't think smoking cessation is treatment in the context of cancer care, but we can change this. We can influence this. We got NCC and guidelines and certain general report. Really exciting. Trust the data. This is going to be really easy. Tobacco's bad. Not to worry about that one so much, right? Biggest thing right here, I can't have my docs take too much time on tobacco cessation. I am extremely expensive. It is a matter of time until I get hammered about why aren't you seeing enough patients because I can generate, I am not kidding, 10 to 50 times more revenue per minute or hour doing what I do in radiation oncology than I can in cessation. So a little reality about knowing what administrators are really going to support and you can leverage this well is a big deal. We started modeling this out. So I want to try and put this in the right perspective. We tried to figure out what's the cost of smoking in cancer patients. What I mean by that is what additional cost is caused by smoking? Now, we haven't published this yet. We're getting pretty close to getting this thing out, but I want to make sure you all get a chance to see it and think about it. So this model might change a little bit, but this, we're, we're pretty much there. What we did was we looked at overall mortality, really hard to ascertain. We looked at toxicity, hard to do. Second line treatment is, our second line cancer is, uh, our, our second primary cancer is irrelevant. You can't keep track of that. But you can, we have a really good risk, 61% increased risk of cancer-related mortality. That means you've got a guaranteed 60% increased risk of first-line treatment failure. As a matter of fact, you probably have 80 or 100, 120%, right? But we have a good measure of first-line treatment failure. So we said, let's just focus on cancer treatment. Failure of first-line treatment and what happens after that? Second, third, fourth line, right? So what we did was we went back and said, a whole different series of iterations for this size cancer center, these types of patients with low baseline failure rates, high baseline failure rates, you know, higher and lower prevalence of smoking. We have all these things together. But if we just looked at this for the United States as a whole, 20% smoking prevalence in cancer, 1.6 million patients. We assumed a 30% baseline failure rate, which is pretty conservative. It's probably about 34 to 37% baseline in non-smoking patients. This is $50,000 for second, for next line cancer treatment. This is $100,000. I'm telling you right now, next line cancer treatment is living between 100 and 250. Uh, 50 means that you're gonna treat someone and unfortunately probably gonna pass away pretty quick without coming back in the hospital. If we focused on 100,000, $3.4 billion a year in the United States. Attributable failures, this isn't all smokers. This is attributable failures from smoking in cancer patients and the cost associated with it. $3.4 billion a year. That's what we're paying, probably conservatively, just for cancer treatment after failure of first-line treatment in people who smoke. Does that make sense? Actually, for you all, you all are probably know attributable failure models better than I do. Most of the time, clinicians have to wiggle into it a little bit. That's a real estimate, probably a conservative estimate. This is my daughter who, believe it or not, is a lot older, but looks about the same. Just remember, if you're driving down the road, fat cat in it, minding your own business, there might be someone right behind you ready to bite your head off. So you always got to be cautious about what you try and take on and what you try and do. When you start thinking about cessation program, we'll get into more of this a little bit later, but I want to make sure I have some time for, for uh, questions. You want to think about how you want to try and provide cessation support, and then this is a big deal, obtaining institutional support. There's some categories here. You can actually look at this in DaVita, and I've published a few things on this. 
But in reality, when you start thinking about cancer center flow, remember, you, you, cancer center flow, you, you may be not thinking about the entirety of the opportunity here. You got outreach and awareness, screening, intake, which means people come in, they get registered, come to the cancer center the first time. Assessment and diagnosis, some people are diagnosed, some people don't know what they've got yet. So you've got this period of assessment. Workup and stabilization um, and management. The initial cancer treatment. Notice we all the way down to six before we get to cancer treatment, right? You got follow up and even recurrence end of life management. There's a whole bunch of little things underneath this, but those categories are important to consider because that's what cancer center flow looks like. And that's what patients are gonna experience. I'm a huge proponent of referral. We can talk a lot about this, but if you're gonna choose a pattern of referral, you gotta figure out how you're gonna assess this, right? You want structured questions, period. You want structured questions. Are you a smoker? That's a dumb question because right now, I could have been a smoker 30 years ago. Do you smoke? That's another one. Uh, no, I don't smoke. I know that my last cigarette was on my way to the appointment today, or, you know, I only smoke five of these. That's not really a smoker. Structured, annotated questions. Personnel, who's going to do this? Decision support, how are you going to efficiently identify tobacco use so you can make a decision about what you do next? Location, if you're going to put a cessation program in practice, location's a big deal. Don't slow my clinic down. Don't slow down a clinic that already I've got people at the end of the day almost every day who are behind. You won't win that war. So location is a big deal. If you have a, P, a, a clinic, there is a clinic like this, that's literally a half mile away from the oncology site, <laughs> patients are not going to go get radiation or chemo and then walk a half mile for cessation support. It ain't going to happen. Phone is a big one. I'm a proponent of phone. We've got a lot of receptiveness to phone-based cessation support. Access to the EMRs, talking uh, earlier today about access to the EMRs actually sounds exciting. I'm, I'm interested in hearing more. Access to scheduling is a huge deal. Uh, a lot of times I can't schedule a patient no matter what, so access to scheduling and registration is a big deal. Access on site and intensities is a big deal, and identifying existing resources, pharmacotherapy, and follow up. These types of considerations, like I said, you can go back for, but these are the practical issues you're going to have in trying to design a program in the context of cancer care. I want to emphasize back-end savings. I already mentioned that earlier, back-end savings, which is different than what administrators think of now, which is front-end billing or front-end revenue. Back-end savings, back-end savings. What's feasible or, op or optimal? Long short of it is that here, everything is possible, right? In reality, you can deliver messages, do referrals, pharmacotherapy, counseling, referrals to different quit lines and buy-in anywhere. When you start thinking about succession specialists, separate clinic, clinical staff based on small versus large center, kind of parse a little bit out there, I can tell you that here, anything's possible. Ask, advise, refer, and ask, advise, connect. The only thing I want you to get out of this, ask, identify with structured assessments, refer, connect, I want you to focus on the middle. You got clinicians. I really don't care if clinicians don't do or don't provide cessation support. As a matter of fact, kind of almost don't want them to. What I do want them to do is this. Listen, tobacco is bad for your cancer treatment. The best thing you can do to make your cancer treatment more effective is quit smoking. I have no idea how you're going to quit. I got no idea how you're going to quit. But our cessation program is going to contact you to help. That's easy. Nursing, physicians, uh, registration staff, one consistent message across the entire cancer center can be that same thing. Hey, best thing you can do to help your cancer treatment is quit smoking. I don't know how you're going to do it, but we got a program to help you with it. I'm gonna go ahead and do this. This is a diagnostic and treatment timeline. Right now we have an area of concern that leads to a diagnosis, which eventually leads to an oncology consultation, treatment, and follow-up. Nationally, we're trying to shorten this time. I can tell you that the longer you quit smoking, the greater the benefit for cancer treatment. The reason I put this up here is that if we can get oncology care to engage primary care early with this message, if you think you have a patient who might have cancer, now is the time to help them quit smoking. Then you might get people to quit by the time they come in to this oncology consult. Now we're improving therapeutic efficacy. Now I'm getting at that number needed to treat. I've gotten people enough time where they've been able to quit smoking, probably with people who've been trying to get them to quit for years anyway. That's a message we can take from oncology to primary care today. If you think you have a patient with cancer, get them to quit smoking. Tell them it's important because your cancer treatment really helps. It depends on 
on them quitting smoking. It makes a big difference if they quit. Additional considerations, synergizing research with clinical activities can make a huge difference. We have a program at, at uh, MUSC now, started just three and a half years ago. We have nine funded extramural grants that use that program just in the first three years. So we're able to actually provide clinical care and use it for research related purposes. Efficiency, ooh, big one. <laughs> this is easy. Develop a clear vision. Smoking is bad. Pretty easy vision, right? Smoking is bad. All patients should get cessation support, and I can't emphasize enough, we're in this together. You know, when we came to MUSC, one of the things did in radiation medicine was standardized cessation process, and in my startup, I had funds to develop a cessation program. But the nurses, the therapists, the, radi uh, the physicists, radiation oncologists, it was so easy, and they were excited. You know, we can talk to patients about how are they doing with smoking. I'm making a difference to make their cancer treatment better. That makes sense? It should. You have consistency of vision, and you can deliver it across the continuum of cancer care. When you think about, there's one more thing I still have to add here, and I just I haven't had the time. When you start thinking about tobacco and evidence-based medicine, realize with regards to cancer care, you've got a huge basic science component. You have all these clinical effects. You have all the behavioral aspects. And now over here, in this little black box I haven't put in yet, cost. And that cost is building. So when you think about tobacco and cancer patients, I'm hoping you're thinking about this a little bit differently. Remember, it's difficult to comprehend how insane some people can be, especially when you're insane. Sometimes we've been doing things for so long and training the same way for so long that it's hard for us to break out of it. This will be a slide that I have for me forever. Statistics show that teen pregnancy drops off significantly after age 25. I don't need to know too much about that study. I don't need to know how it was designed. I agree, right? Sometimes you have the opportunity to look at good questions that need to be identified. Smoking and cancer patients is one of them. And this is the institution that can take a variety of leads in this area. And with this, I'll uh, open to questions. Thank you so much, Graham. Um, it brings a lot of questions to mind uh, for me and I'm sure for the audience. So just a quick uh, estimate. Uh, from your $3.4 billion that it costs nationally, I kind of worked out that maybe we'd, we'd um, be able to prevent a recurrence in about 600 cancer patients in Maryland. So it would uh, actually be a savings of, say, $60 million. Um, is, that a, is that a calculation that you think is legitimate from your data? I don't know the numbers, actually, in Maryland. I ran them. I, I've been usually I Yeah, you've presented the from nation. Some other countries uh -huh. and territories and stuff. I could do it there. I would say that's probably uh, reasonable. And it might not sound like a huge difference, but uh, 600 patients and $60 million. I'm telling you, the cost of cancer treatment is a huge deal. So I, that could be reasonable yeah. here. I don't have the intake data well enough, but that's yeah. probably reasonable, yeah. yeah. And, and I don't know uh, if that's here at the cancer center by itself or for all of Maryland. For all of Maryland. So it's about 5% of all the cancer patients, yeah. Uh, do we have questions from the audience? I have another one about uh, clinical trial participation. So we've been interested at Sydney Kimmel in, in what it is that helps people participate in trials. And it looks like, for lung cancer anyway, that uh, cigarette smoking actually deters people from participating in trials. Um, and uh, we're not quite sure why, whether it's on the investigator's part, you know, and uh, they're looking for healthy people without complicated lives or, um, or that patients aren't willing to participate because they're a smoker, like they don't participate in uh, primary care visits, uh, for instance. So, um, but you showed the biological data. It's, it seems like maybe we need to um, think about smoking status in our research studies. It's, we do. So in this case, you can incorporate smoking status really pretty easily and pretty cheaply. We always talk about data management and the cost and who's going to do this in clinical trials, especially when we start talking about this in cooperative group designs. But in reality, it's not that hard, particularly in the context of what the, the targeted agent, which is what we usually use now, what that is, or even in cytotoxic therapeutics or different radiation approaches. So 
that NCI ACR approach can give a structured uh, format with some core questions and some optional questions. Mm -hmm. That's a great start. And then if you can use biochemical confirmation, primarily really in people who, you know, are either high risk for smoking because they just quit or they've been reported current smoking time of diagnosis. So you don't have to have it. You got 100 patients that come in, 20 of them smoke. You really need it maybe in those 20. You don't need it in the whole 100 necessarily. Mm -hmm. So you can optimize strategies to try and do the biochemical confirmation, uh, which can help assist with this as well. Mm -hmm. But I will say this, real time's important. Doing smoking status with a blood specimen two years earlier and correlating it to cancer treatment two years later, that's not gonna get me enough. I need to know what's happening in proximity to the cancer treatment, and that's important to consider. Yeah. We're past. Yeah. In public health, we're always so oriented yeah. to um, prevention um, I, I so, would, so your focus on cancer patients is yeah. a is a new one for us. I will say this: I am I would be so happy if I never heard ever smoking in a trial again ever. That would be great if we could just get past ever smoking and we could just really get current former as a start. Uh, ever doesn't do me a whole lot of good anymore. Um, here at Hopkins, we've talked a lot about engaging palliative care from the time of cancer diagnosis instead of waiting until much later. Um, I don't, I guess I'm curious as to whether if there's any similar movement um, where you are, if you see those providers as another aspect um, of care that should be engaged in supporting cessation or if that's sort of not relevant um, if you're used to kind of engaging palliative care later on. So the, that's a very loaded question, and I want to make sure I answer it in the right way. The, I've seen palliative care who really knows what the treatment plan is for cancer or stroke or cardiovascular disease or whatever. But I've also seen palliative care where they really don't know what the disease management or expectations are, where it hasn't really been communicated very well. I think smoking in the context of palliative care with either an early referral or later is a great idea. But I think a lot of places really haven't integrated palliative care well into their management model. And so I would not want to rely on palliative care to provide the service. Not because I don't like them or anything, but what I'm getting at is that the integration in most centers is very poor. And so I think we could get there. I personally really like cessation in context with pharmacies because they can look at medications, they can do reconciliation, they can prescribe medications in a lot of places, they're already doing diabetes management and anticoagulation and things, so, you know, they have some access and you're not repeating extra appointments, uh, but every place is a little different. Palliative care, I think you could, I just don't think I'd rely on it as the only thing. I would ask a question of, I don't know exactly who's in the crowd, uh, there's a big question at the end of this, and I probably shouldn't treat you like my residents and ask you what you think that is, so I'm going to say, I think that one of the most important next steps for us is to figure out a cohesive way to engage insurers. It's hard for me to do where I'm at. You all formulate policy and development and integration. But if we had something that caused this many problems in cancer patients, it'd be great if we could have very strong advocacy and support by insurers who are taking care of patients. And so I would offer that as a comment and certainly welcome anything from the crowd in that area. Any thoughts on that? I would, I would think that a health system uh, approach might yield some nice results in terms of, you know, policies within the health system and uh, in actually incorporating a large number of the population, both before cancer and after cancer. I wanted to ask one more question, though. This is um, maybe a Jim Zabora question. So <laughs> there he is. <laughs> um, about uh, families who smoke. Uh, do, have you looked at the role of families in the smoking cessation success? Um, you know, for cancer patients, so everybody gathers around the patient and and it's likely a number of the family's members smoke. And um, is there a benefit at all that you know of of helping the family quit smoking to in order to help the cancer patient? So um, from, do you want to let Jim answer first or me? Or it doesn't matter to me. I can tell you what my thoughts are, but happy to 
You know, in this case, we, at least with regards to cancer care, my primary focus is the cancer patients. There are other people actually looking at this, and I don't know exactly what their data are. So this would not be my area of expertise as the extension of family, but I can tell you that as a part of our process, we offer access to try and help people quit smoking. However, and this is another constraint, we uh, cannot provide care through our medical service to family members unless they are registered and enrolled through the EMR under care for MUSC. So in that situation, I can cajole our cessation specialists to when a person comes in or family members with them, talk about it, but then if they're not willing to come in as a patient to our center, which is a huge limitation, I'm a doctor that has to follow what the EMR tells me to do. That's where we're at now, just in case you're wondering. Because of that limitation, I have to refer a lot to the EMR. And so, or excuse me, to uh, Quitline, sorry. Uh, a lot of people have to refer, family members have to refer to the Quitline. So I think there's a position for it. I think people are actively looking at this. Um, I'm not one of them that's an expert in this area. There's some people who are doing a good job with this. I think it is necessary uh, and certainly open to comments. Yeah, just what I would add is family, from our perspective, is absolutely critical. Uh, we're just completing a household smoking cessation study where we've recruited households, multiple smokers, because our feeling is that uh, you know most of the guidelines, as you know them very well, that identify high-risk populations, a cancer patient who smokes, and a, an adolescent, a, a woman who's pregnant, and so on. And we tend to focus on individuals rather than the household so that if we get that individual to stop smoking, then they return to the household where there might be one or more smokers and the chances of relapse are extremely high. And if not, they're still exposed to the environmental tobacco smoke, you know, second and third hand. So we're just kind of winding that study down and we've had very good success. Although what we have found, and we're doing this in a community uh, in a very high risk area, uh, primarily minority population, and we've gotten very good adherence and so on, so we're anxious to see. And we're, we are doing cotinine measurements and then working with environmental health to put in air nicotine monitors into the homes. And we've gotten very good adherence with that, too, to show kind of a physiological as well as an environmental outcome. So that's coming. We're just about winding down. But I don't know any way else to do it without getting all the smokers involved in one way or another. Yeah, I, I agree the importance. I, I definitely agree with that. A lot of studies, I think, have shown that. I would add one thing, and maybe it's a question I'll ask back. You know, this we haven't written this up, but we did phone-based cessation support, and then we have in-person, more intensive. We're having some, we're having resistance coming back in person. Cancer patients are just, you know, even when they come in, they're just worn out, um, and they don't necessarily want to come. But they're still very receptive to phone. And so I think a good hybrid model would be an excellent series of advances. Right. Are you seeing, I'm, and family, well, I'm we're, we're using the NCCN guidelines, so we're doing three educational sessions, 45 minutes a piece. So people do come in, but we make them uh, incredibly accessible. So for example, we'll go into a senior citizen high rise, recruit three to five households, and we'll actually conduct the classes there. I see. Because uh, we have that mobility. And then we, and we provide nicotine replacement therapy, and we're doing supportive counseling afterwards by way of cell phone. So you're going to the patient much more than them coming to you. Have to, uh, yeah, have yeah, to, yeah. just because of the, the accessibility issues. It's, it's the largest factor. And then we have another study we've designed where we are talking to smokefree.gov to add, since we've had good success with use of cell phones, is to, uh, to begin to integrate their apps so we can see exactly how much a person in the community is willing to use that app and is that of any additional benefit. Well, this has a, been a great discussion and presentation. Thanks so much, Graham. I welcome all of you to have some pizza with us out in the gallery. Uh, to be eligible for the pizza, stop by with Nicole, get your ticket, and um, thanks so much again, and let's give uh, Warren a hand.